Um, coming up next, we've got a talk on ADA, uh, exploitation in the era of formal verification, a peek at a new frontier with ADA Core Spark. So please help me welcome to the stage, Alex and Adam. Hello everyone, and welcome to the presentation in the exploitation in the area of formal verification, a peek at the new frontier with ADA Core Spark. Some folks already approach us and ask what is this picture here. What you can see, the answer is pretty dumb because there is no logic behind that. It's just kind of visualization that in the any kind of the software you might have a wrong path, correct path, failed path, and some of the path are just correctly, could be correctly verified. Some of the path is just wrong or undefined behavior. This picture looks cool. That's why we decided to use it, but don't find any meanings here because there is not. If you find, let me know. I'll be happy to listen. Uh, so, I don't want to spend too much uh, time on this slide. Uh, my name is Adam Zabrotsky and together with Alex um, we have been doing some security research for some time already, for a few decades to be honest. And uh, yeah, there is some private contact to us, some short bio to us. And this research has been done during our work at NVIDIA. Both of us works at NVIDIA currently. Um, so yes, apparently this uh, research which we're going to present is not only the results of our, um, both of our work, but entire offensive security research team, which I'm currently leading. And uh, big kudos also to Jared, Max, and Nicola which also were involved uh, in this research. And uh, before we also move to the formal verification problem, especially in the software, we need to speak a bit more about software vulnerabilities because this is what the formal verified method is supposed to address. And you cannot speak about, formal, uh, about the software vulnerabilities without touching the problem of memory safety. So just quick uh, intro about memory safety. What is memory safety? It's apparently a term used by security uh, engineers to describe uh, a state of being protected from various bugs related to uh, memory access. And of course, there's a bunch of bugs who falls into this category, including every type of overflows on memory, like on the stack, on the heap, on the global, every piece of the memory which can be overflowed, any kind of out of band read and write, an invalid page, including null port the reference, any kind of use after free, use after return, use after scope, etc. There is many types of use after bugs. Also, any type of unutilized memory, including wild pointers or uh, memory leaks, invalid free, all of that, it's a memory safety issue. But not all of the security vulnerabilities are memory safety issues. In, so some of of them, like any type of the overflows, integer overflows, arithmetic overflows, are not memory safety issues. Logical issues is also not memory safety issue. Error handling, race condition, there is a star because race condition on data access is type of the memory safety issue, but in general, it's not. And there's a few more, but what is worth to mention that even this is not a memory safety issue, they often result in a memory safety issues. So if you have any kind of integer overflow uh, on the size of how much data you want to copy, it's not memory safety issues, but when you start to copy the data, then you will have a memory safety issue. Uh, so why we even speak about memory safety? Because Apparently, memory safety errors are today the biggest attack surface. And I really mean it. It's the biggest software type of the bugs. And there's a few reasons behind that. Some of them are easy to spot, like this one. Memory and safe language has been chosen to use to develop a core of the execution environment. So every type of the uh, operating system, like Windows, Linux, Macintosh, are written in memory and safe language, like C or C++. And the question is why? Because at that time when this ecosystem has been developed, we already have memory safe language, which could give us opportunity to not have these bugs. But we still develop them in the memory safe language. There's a few reasons behind that. Some of them is because at that time, the hardware was not performed as well as today. There was much slower, and the code in the memory sa unsafe language was faster. And also it gives developers for fingering control over the memory address, where the code can be executed with the attributes. And this is one of the reasons why memory safe was chosen to develop these ecosystems. Also, memory safety bugs are very well researched, as everybody knows. Uh, some professional exploiters even developed the exploitation framework to target specific software stack. I've seen by myself, reverse engineers, one of the framework developed to exploit Windows kernel vulnerabilities. You have a full framework, you just find the bug and expose uh, primitive, like read, write, and include into the framework, and the entire exploitation process magically runs. It bypasses ASLR, it bypasses any modern mitigation. So you just find the bug, plug in the framework, run, and it's done. So it's a very well-researched idea. And additionally, memory researchers 
do automation on focusing for memory safety bug detection. They don't even need to understand what the software does. You just take an open source project, uh, you uh, recompile this with the various code coverage uh, instrumentation, then you spin up code coverage driven fuzzers, uh, and you just run it and you have bugs. And apparently it's kind of not rare that some researchers, they just pick up most popular libraries without going into details to analyze what the architecture it is. Let's just fuzz it, let's find the bug and we have, we have benefits, yes? So it's not also a theory because a big corporation starting to struggle with this problem more and more and they cannot ignore it anymore and they want to study a few cases and the biggest uh, corporation who produce software is apparently Microsoft. And um, uh, they also face this problem for ages and uh, they make a few presentations about that which I want to recap here. So in 2002, um, Microsoft created something called Trust Trustworthy Computing, TWC, where they wanted to, they, they cannot ignore anymore the security issues in their ecosystem because uh, larger customers like government agencies, financial companies starting to be impacted by the security problems on the Windows, and this is Microsoft products, so they cannot ignore it, and they needed to do something on that. So they created TWC, and then they focused on the few areas, and one of them was security, and uh, as a pillars of, of this initiative, and uh, they developed, uh, as a direct implication of that, a few interesting things, like t uh, TWC develop SDLC, security development life cycles process, to be able to make the quality of the code higher from the beginning. They also created MSRC, which is Microsoft Security Response Center, which treated security bugs differently than any other bugs. So they also know that this is something which can impact the security of the ecosystem. So they are also starting to fuzz by themselves some of the software. They are also starting to do bug hunting. They are also starting to do exploit research. So they do a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, and additionally, in 2019, they said, okay, we spent so much engineered effort. We spent so much money on that. Do we see improvements? Do we see any benefits of all of that? And in, in 2019, they, they analyzed the uh, last 12 years of all of the security cases reported to them, and that's what they saw. So this is a slide from Microsoft itself. As you can see, uh, the type of the bugs, security bugs which are reported to them are more or less the same over the time. In the 2006, around 70% of all of the security issues was memory safety issues. In 2018, we still see 70% of memory safety issues. So does it mean nothing changes over the time? Even, uh, even of these years of investment. It's not, obviously, because these slides show what changes. So we see that the type of the memory safety issues which are reported are differently. So in the beginning, in 2006, we see the quarter of the bugs are stack overflow vulnerabilities, while in the 2014, there is almost zero of them. And the reason is not because this bug disappear. It just doesn't give a benefit for the attacker because the modern mitigation makes the exploitation of this bug sometimes impossible or very hard. But in the same time, they saw the rise of other type of issues like use after free. This is this gray um, uh, box here. You can see the huge rise of them because there's no any mitigations on that. So it's most trivial to exploit. And then they introduce mitigation and you can see that the amount of the bugs are shrinking. Uh, and now we can see there is a rise on the edge of, of this year. You can see the rise of yellow, which is type of the confusion because there is no mitigation, so people move to that type of the attack. So something changes, but overall, 70% of the bugs are memory safety issues. And uh, Google case, let's speak about that, because it's slightly different. They wanted to avoid the problem which Microsoft had instead of patching bad software with adding new security layers. They wanted to make something differently. So they designed a Google Chrome uh, in the security in mind. They have a high code quality. They constantly fast that since 2015 because they knew the bugs will be there. They wanted to catch them in-house as soon as possible. And you know, Google has power. So they fast it in the various platform. They use OSS fast platform. They use Google Cloud Platform, which essentially means they have essentially unlimited computer power. They also have dedicated team to improve various exploit mitigations. And in 2020, they did exactly the same job. They analyzed all of the security issues since 2015 when they started to fast, what were reported to them uh, with the high and critical severity. And guess what happened? They end up in exactly the same place, even they took different approach. Roughly 70% of the bugs are memory safety issues. And half of these bugs are used after free bugs. And even more, they knew that these bugs will be there. So they designed the Google Chrome in such a case that these bugs will be there. They knew this. They heavily sandbox them and they make a warranty that one of the bugs is not enough to take over of the host machine. Although this is a quote from their blog, but we are reaching the limits of sandboxing and site isolation. And uh, yeah, that's pretty concerning. And uh, what about open source world? Is the open source world is different than corporation world? And there is not 
many research in this area, although we found one interesting um, uh, research done by univer Technical University in Darmstadt in Germany, Continental AG and Interlabs, which summarized it as we find no clear evidence that the vulnerability rate of widely used software decreases over the time, even in the popular stable releases. The fixing of the bugs does not seem to reduce the rate of the newly identified vulnerabilities. So it's not much better, I guess. So are we doomed? Is memory safety something who will be for, uh, with us forever that we cannot fix anything? So apparently, no. Uh, people trying to approach this problem because we understand it much more, and we have a various ways how to try to address that. We have a new mitigation push to the hardware, like memory tagging, who are physically in the hardware trying to stop the memory safety issues from being exploited, or even happens before it happens at first time. That's the memory uh, tagging idea. We also have ideas of creating a new architecture of the memory like Cherry architecture. Cherry architecture treats differently in memory, so it also will be redesigned the hardware. And there is a different approach, different path. Let's rewrite all of our software in the formally verified languages, or use the language which has static method of proving that the memory safety doesn't exist. So we have Rust, and people starting to rewrite the program in the Rust, but we have also the formal methods, which is even stronger, uh, which can uh, formally prove that there is absence of memory safety issues and there is absence of undefined behavior. So pass formal verification, you must to be safe. And one of the language which gives the which is the most advanced of giving the attributes of the formal verified software is apparently at the core Spark, where Alex will speak more about now. Yeah, let's revisit a few key points from our presentation last year. Sure. So, Spark is a subset of other core language. Uh, it's basically a programming language formally defined, including a set of analysis tools. And this, the real strength of this uh, comes from these analysis tools. These are not proof, not stack, and a few more. So uh, one of the key features is that it's statically provable, and the proof is produced by this uh, GNAT proof tool. So you have to run it after you compile, build your code. So uh, what can you achieve with this uh, formal proofs? So, uh, uh, this, this tool can prove Using this formal verif verifier, you can prove that certain dynamic checks cannot fail. So you can just omit them. Uh, the compiler may uh, omit them and do not build. That may give you some performance benefits. Uh, also, it can prove that there may not be runtime errors. So everything runs in a well-defined state. You will not have any errors uh, that arise in runtime. And you will have hard proofs, like formal verified. Uh, so also, uh, Adacore Spark is, f is memory safe language like Rust, but it also has a very strong typing system, uh, which is much stronger than Rust. Uh, so for example, you will not have arithmetic overflows, integer overflows, or like, or like stuff like that. And uh, because of this, uh, it traditionally is used in industries such as automotive, IoT, uh, Spark is safety, safety certified. Uh, so NVIDIA constantly use that for uh, build st safety certified code. Uh, so the uh, key point is that you can build buggy code, but the problems are detected by the tools. You really have to run them to to see uh, to actually verify that your code doesn't have any problems. And tools are orthogonal to each other. You have to run all of these tools because they detect different kinds of problems. So when we first approached the project written in Spark, we for, we thought about this attack surface that we can use. So uh, obviously. No memory corruption bugs are there anymore because it is memory safety language. So um, also there are no pointers. And so problems with pointers do not apply to Spark. But uh, since 2019, Spark has a feature. Uh, so it's introduced the concept of pointers pretty much like uh, Rust borrow checking. Um, so. Uh, what about arithmetic security? So we have very strong typing systems, so that's why arithmetic uh, issues also don't apply. 
Uh, we, uh, our project was single-threaded, so we didn't care about parallel execution, but if you do care about it, there is extension to Spark called Ravenscar, we, we, which we can use. Um, so what is left is attack surface. Uh, these are logic bugs and bad design. Obviously, if you prove wrong things, you can have correct proofs about wrong assumptions, and uh, you will have bugs in this case. Uh, yes, so everything what uh, Alex said, it's uh, compelling, sounds compelling. Apparently, uh, it's a recap, you can have a, a buggy code, you just might run, uh, must run all of the tools. If you don't run them, you still have a bugs. And uh, the tools are orthogonal to itself, so you must run all of them. If you just pick some of them, you will not have all of these benefits. And most of the potential security issues must be in the design issues or uh, in the logical errors. And uh, bugs also can be introduced by the compiler itself, uh, which we can see later on this slide. Uh, so everything sounds very compelling and pretty interesting, but benefits. Do we really see benefits in the software written in Spark or any form of verified language comparing to, to non-Spark code in memory and safe language? And uh, apparently, before we do go there, I just want to quickly say that what our team does because we did this evaluation. So just to give you an overview why we think we are the good guys to do this comparison, we essentially work as a third party company inside of the company. We just take a product after the parcel of the checkbox and they said, okay, ship it, it's secure. Then we said, no, don't ship it. Let's review something which is the most critical and can input components. So that's what we do. And we, uh, since 2020, we analyzed 17 very high uh, product, impact product, so which it's not a small feature, it's a huge product. And, uh, um, uh, 10 of them used a software written in memory and safe language, and four of them had a software written in Spark. And what is important, that um, four of this project was fully written in Spark. There was not even a single line of code written in the non-formally verified language. And two of them was written in Spark, and the Spark was the Imp like imposer and um, uh, enforcer of the security warranties of the software, while inside they could be uh, still software written in the memory and safe language, but they didn't, they didn't uh, change the security warranties of the entire ecosystem, so it's fine to have it there. So we get a closer look on them, and we wanted to compare, do we really see the benefits? And so, first question, how do you compare them? How do you compare them as an apple to apple, not apple to anything else, and have some kind of bad uh, impression about the quality of that? So it's difficult, so what we did, we just um, we just put the raw data of all of the projects which we, which we reviewed. We choose the one which could be compared. We sort them out by the time frame of the review which we spent um, analyzing the software. We also... Um, uh, put what is the total bug counts, what is the percentage of the memory safety issue, and what is the type of the software which we review. And by sorting by the type, we could be able somehow to compare, because if the type of the software is the same, we can more or less compare how do they behave with the formal verified language. So first project in, in Spark could be also, not could, do, do, does not apply to this comparison, because it's uh, focused on the hardware modeling, and we have nothing in the memory safe, unsafe language to compare with, so it was out of scope. So we left with the free project in Spark which you can compare. So let's look at the first one. This is operating system like software which we fully develop in Spark in the formal proof this operating system like software. And also we had in the memory and safe language another type of the software also internally developed which was developed in C and C++. And as you can see we spent three weeks in the memory and safe language for the reviewing and six weeks which is twice as long on Spark. But we found only five, ten bucks in Spark while, in the, while we uh, spent twice as long as reviewing the memory and safe language, and in the memory and safe language we found 45 total bug counts. It's a huge difference. Additionally, as you can see, there is almost 52% of the bugs, 53% of the bugs are memory safety issues in the uh, memory and safe language, while in Spark it's zero. Um, another software, which is also uh, good to compare, is the project 4, the last project in the Spark, which is a boot software, also written in Spark, and we spent almost the same amount of the time of reviewing as booting software uh, in the memory uh, unsafe language. And apparently memory unsafe language boot software was not written by us, not written by NVIDIA. It was written by external company, although it was uh, using in the NVIDIA product, so that's why we review it. And as you can see, we found uh, uh, around 5 bugs in the Spark, and 17 
bugs in the memory and safe language. Again, a huge difference. If you look at the percentage of the memory safety, it matches the industry standard. 65% are memory safety issue in memory and safe language and 0% in Spark. The last project is a pretty um, difficult, let's say, because it's kind of hybrid project combining two different other software. It's a boot, uh, it's a root of trust software. And uh, additionally, there is a functionality of being resource management software. And apparently in the memory and safe language, we had two separate projects doing exactly the same functionality. So two of these projects in the memory and safe combined together gives more or less the same functionality and the same code size of the software written in Spark. So we spent more or less the same amount of the time frame, four weeks plus less than two weeks and five weeks in Spark, so more or less the same time frame. We found around 40 bucks in the memory and safe language and 28 bucks in Spark. Again, big benefits. And uh, so, in the recap, it's a conclusion based on this average data. Formal verified software can be free from the memory safety problem. This is star, as you can see later. There is still some room for abuse. But in general, yes, it can be memory safe. Uh, formally verified software has much higher quality because Spark apparently enforces a lot of attributes like secure and strict coding practice, strong typing system. Uh, you need to correctly initialize any data, otherwise before you use it, you will be like killed by the compiler, you cannot use it. And also, what is worth to mention, Spark is not a silver bullet. You just see that you can apply and all of your problems disappear. It's a pretty heavy software, uh, programming language, so you cannot just sit down and write a code like in the C. You write a function, you write another function, no, you must be really sit down, think about the software, design it properly, uh, map any object, and then when you have that, then you can start write, starting to compile them together and write the software. So you need to keep this in mind. Additionally, Spark can prove that there is no dynamic checks cannot fail. There is a something called absent of runtime uh, errors, and depends on your level of assurance, you might have warranty they will never appear. So these checks might not be in the, in the binary because you don't need them anymore. Uh, also, it enables much more efficient security efforts because at first you will not see dummy bugs there like we sometimes see in the memory safe software and something which is not verified or unprovable is very clearly marked with the attributes so you just focus on this function what is unproved and what is unverified and uh, focus there and there is also something called precondition post condition ghost code i not go want to go into details on that but essentially you can, can clearly define the state of the software in that specific point of time so you know what to expect from the software and how to behave you just read that stuff and you know what is the purpose of the specific software for a state machine. And um, what also is uh, to, to, to worth to mention is that most of the bugs which we found in Spark requires apparently very deep knowledge and understanding of the software. So in the end of the day, the bugs which you found are a very deep type of the bugs. You have architecture issues, design issues. And if you look from the statistical perspective, when we do review the project in the memory safe language, on average, on f in four weeks, we found around 40, 50 bugs. While in Spark, we spent six weeks, which is longer on average, we found around five, 10 bugs which you can see there is, a, there is a benefit which you can see internally in our company. So what is the real bugs? What are the example of the bugs which we are speaking about here? So yeah, formal verified software can produce you the software which is very strong, but there is always but. So let's look at this but in the Spark. So first problem is a problem with the signature verification, which we found in one of the projects. So there was a function uh, who uh, calls, let's say, verify public key. And this verify public key has a specific checks. If the, if the software is configured to verify the signature, then it verifies the signature. So what is this root of trust for this function of verify signature? Let's take a closer look. And we can see that this function, get authentication, has apparently three states. It's a state authentication none authentication RSA, but there is also state authentication unknown. But the function uh, verify public key never takes into account this third state. So is this state even possible to appear? Because if you have authentication RSA, everything is fine. Every authentication known, we don't need to verify, so it's okay. What about authentication unknown? And apparently the root of trust of authentication unknown is coming from the register on the hardware, and the register occupied three bits. But three bits gives you eight states, not two states. So eight states apparently means that authentication unknown will be assigned to six states of this hardware. Not so, the, and these states, these six states are never taken into account in the verify public key because we only take into account verify known and verify RSA. So what happens if you have authentication unknown? 
Apparently, the software will treat it in the same ways as authentication none. So in the out of eight states, only one state enforces signature verification, and seven states uh, are handled as there is no verification at all. And again, prover will not be able to catch that because it's a logical error. It's a logical error how it's defined by the de developer. So this type of bugs you can still have here. And this is a problem with compiler, which Alex will speak more about. Yeah, one of the projects we reviewed uh, had fault injection protection in scope. Uh, so the code must incorporate some kind of mitigation against fault protection uh, to, to enable this fault mitigation. Uh, so here you see a disassembly of the binary that we analyzed. Uh, we see some uh, memory compare function are uh, um, implemented in a, in a constant way so that we th this is protected. Um, constant time ex uh, execution. But at the same time, we see a single point of weakness, which is definitely a bad thing if you care about fault injections. Um, so what happened here? We analyzed the source code and saw that developers implemented everything correctly. Uh, but uh, for some reason, compiler optimized out certain functions which weakened the protection. So this was essentially a compiler problem. The, uh, and you only can see that in the binaries. So that's why you not only have to analyze your source code, but the binaries. Uh, yes, and that's another interesting example uh, of the issue. It's not a one issue. We found a very small issues here and there, but then we realized when we combine them together, we have a pretty serious security issues. It's a problem with the auto utilization problem with the absence of random error, problem with the uh, design and performance, and then in the end when we mix them together, we found something interesting. So first thing first, Spark, of course, cannot prove the correctness of some metadata coming from untrusted sources, like from the external media, from the ROM, because how it can. You, you don't know what's there. But although if you want to prove such kind of software, you can provide this knowledge to the prover so the prover know what are the limits or what are the bounds track of specific untrusted data. And this is what the developer did here. They essentially provide some manual uh, verification of specific, uh, for specific contracts to help prover prove what they want to be proved, essentially. Uh, so what was verified there? Essentially, they verified the maximum size of the external media to not cross through the uh, out of band of the memory. They also verified what the local buffer are, what the minimum size is. And also there is some other checks which are boring, so I didn't include there, but there is also, you cannot start reading from the beginning of the media, but from the offset of the media, so you also don't want to go out of the, um, of the media size. So all of that is there. And um, in short, all of this uh, sanitization for the prover uh, allows you to read the data between X and Y. Uh, we, then, then they will pass the check and the prover will be happy then. And X apparently was some kind of small uh, number, let's say eight bytes, and uh, Y always warranties that you never go outside of the media size. So everything is fine. It's okay so far. We just have some bounce check and the prover can prove it's okay. And then uh, what we saw that the, when we started to execute uh, further this function, they started to read from external media some image that, and this image had another header inside which had different size than the minimum size verified by the prover because the minimum size of this header was 512 bytes, not 8 bytes, which essentially means that some portion of the data, if you read, will be not really utilizing the internal representation of the buffer and internal state of the buffer based on this header also won't be utilized because you just didn't read them, so you cannot parse them, etc., etc. But because before you wanted to reference any memory in Spark, or if you want to use any type system in the Spark, you must utilize them because otherwise you not even compile the software. So what happens? I mean, prover will, will be unhappy if you do that. And uh, uh, what happens then? The developers force initialization, so they zero this memory. Yes, so it's, it's fine. Yes, you just zero the memory which you don't use, so it's fine. Yes. So let's go forward. What we see that somewhere in the middle later on the stage execution, we see the function who also tried to verify some pieces of the memory from this uh, second image which you read. And this is pretty interesting function because first thing first, they utilize the entry points to be always success. It should be fail, but they make it success. So, okay, that's a first red flag. Second red flag, they said, okay, if you already verified some part of the image, why you want to re-verify it again? So if it's already verified, we have some local cache, don't verify anymore, performance improvements, and just go to exit and return success. But there is also, as you can see, there is ID zero. 
this ID zero is internal representation of the state based on the header which you read in the second image, and because you never fully read this image, this ID was initialized by zero as an auto initialization. But apparently, this software, probably written by a different team, assumes that this ID in the internal memory representation is zero. You means there is some performance improvements internal state, so go out and never verify anything. So in the end, because of this auto initialization, this zero was there, and you will never verify the image. And the RSA verification never happened, it skipped. Uh, let's see another example of the bug. So this one uh, is a memory initialization code, and you see that a developer, for some reason, decided to make a certain piece of memory readable for both super, uh, super user mode and user mode. So basically, there is a lack of memory isolation between these two modes. Uh, but the problem was that Spark didn't know the context of this uh, code. So uh, it was a fine code, it compiled correctly, but uh, since there was no context, Prover didn't catch any kind of issue with that. So it's a logical error. We didn't want this memory to be uh, readable by both user and supervisor mode. Um, but uh, since there was no good model of the hardware, the uh, Prover could not find this problem. But uh, it's possible to build such knowledge via ghost code, uh, but it's very difficult to do. Uh, another example of the issue is uh, in this code that performs um, initialization of the tasks during task switch. Uh, and you see that um, certain, uh, certain features of the cache uh, management have been enabled to be accessible from the last privilege mode. And also, the cache is not invalidated on task switch. Uh, so it gives uh, a less privileged mode an ability to perform side-channel attacks. Again, without a good hardware model, the prover could not catch that. Uh, yes, so essentially, if you write the software in Spark, you also should care about the hardware model, everything, otherwise the program might be blind. So this knowledge is possible to be done, but it's difficult. Um, so that's another problem which uh, uh, we found. It's pretty interesting. So as I mentioned, we developed some specific operating system in Spark, and this uh, works uh, on the top of the custom RISC-V uh, microprocessor which we also develop, develop in NVIDIA. And uh, this is a problem which we found during the shared memory. I don't want to go to the details us how this entire operating system works because we can have another talk about that. Although it's already public, it's nothing new that we disclose here. And there's a talk made by the Marco Mitic who fully goes over all of the details how this operating system software works written in Spark. In short, just to recap, this is architecture. You have a hardware. Hardware is sliced by specific uh, sub portion of the hardware, and this sub-portion of the hardware is being seen as exclusive independent hardware for each of the software partition. And the, and the Spark uh, code is here in, as a part of the separation kernel, and the separation kernel essentially enforces um, the um, limits of what the partition can have access to or not. And because it's formally proved and formally verified, we have warranties that we didn't miss anything, that the, what we divided and slice, it's exclusively only accessible for that specific software partition. So we can have multiple partitions and each of them have exclusive view of some specific portion of the hardware and we prove there is no way other way around than that. So essentially everything when you verify it looks fine and looks okay, but then we realize that from the performance reasons, which of course makes sense, if you have the shared libraries used by two separate partitions, we do not want to lose the memory and map the same shared library twice in the different physical page, yes? So you just share the same page. So you have a shared page between the various partition if they use exactly the same shared libraries. And that's interesting because shared partition not only include the text section, but they also can include the data section. And the data section could be written right, yes? So if it's written right and depends on the shared library, we might have interesting information there. This interesting information might include the global state of specific shared library, which could be taken into account in the logic of execution of the specific software in the partition. They also might have initialization data. They also might have some control flow data. They also might have, if it's written in the memory and safe language, pointers. And this is pretty, getting pretty interesting, yes? So apparently, Spark and the prover cannot know what you physically do with the content of this shared library inside of the partition, because how? 
So essentially this opens the room for abuse and depends of course what is in this shared memory and what is in this shared library and also what is in this shared global data. So we found a few interesting bugs in our use cases and we de decided to develop a proof of concept exploit against some of these shared libraries um, in this operating system written in Spark. And we wanted to show you uh, how it works. I'm not sure what will be the quality of the, of the, of the image here but let's try. So this is uh, apparently, oh, mm hmm can we somehow share it? Uh, can I ask for a help some of the goons because when I switch, they doesn't switch to the video mode somehow. Now we have. Okay, apparently it worked. <laughs> so what we see here, uh, I'm not sure how much you can see here, but this is a software, uh, like a partition one. What I was explaining before, this is a in the C written partition one. It's not very complicated, as you can see here. This is one partition main, and there is also trap handler because if something screwed up, we want to you know handle the exceptions. And what you can see in this partition one, we just First, we're trying to define the pointer with specific address of the memory, and as you can see, the address of the memory is a shared buffer. This is a shared buffer which is visible in the partition one and partition two. And this is the address of the shared buffer, uh, a virtual address, of course, 1801,000. So we define the pointer here exactly to point somewhere in the middle of the shared library, which is exactly in the page where this shared library is. It's 18410. Uh, essentially. So it's inside of this uh, point, we point somewhere inside of the shared buffer which is visible in the both partition. And then inside of the shared buffer we will write some value and we write this value. In the partition 2 there is definition where the stack page is. And the stack page is mapped and the virtual address 185000. So we write to the shared buffer address of the stack. That's all what we do in partition 1 and then we switch the partition to partition 2. So that's what the entire software does. This is the magic tool which we use uh, internally in the uh, NVIDIA to be able to uh, deba debug or verify specific hardware, specific software. So we run this magic software, let's say, uh, to be able to connect to the RISC-V uh, engine. We see, we reset RISC-V engine to be clear. We check in the DMS clock. You see there is nothing there. There is no messages. It's just clear state of the RISC-V. And you can see it's clear state, but it's still running. It's here. You see, it's not halted. We still risk five is running. So what we do now, we're trying to reflash the firmware of entire risk five engine in the GPU to exactly have these two partition running together under separation kernel software, which is formerly verified. And so you can see, after reflashing, uh, there is some censorship which we needed to put, but logic, I guess, it's visible. You can see that it's, it's something happened, and you see the core is started. Everything is fine, and you can see the risk five status is not halted after reflashing of this new firmware. It's running, but when you see the demask, you see the partition 2 crashed and we have stack overflow and it's formally verified software and formally verified um, language and can see be able to do stack overflow. That's interesting. So let's check the uh, specific page where we uh, write. So you can see when we dump the software, the, the page of the stack page, it's a physical page which is only visible in the partition 2. It's not visible in the partition 1. We were managed from the partition 1, just put the pointer to the stack and overflow the stack of the memory which you don't even see after the partition switch happens. So you can see it's exactly the address what we overflow. So let's check again. This is the address of physical page. And uh, if, we, if you reset the engine and you check again the DMS, you see it's nothing there. So we are not faking, it's really running the firmware which we designed to run. And uh, yes, and then again, we'll verify the address to be sure this is what we did. So you see in the partition one, we only write the address of the, of the physical page where the stack will be mapped in the partition two, which we don't see in the partition one. And the address of the page physically uh, matches. So that's all what we did here, and this exactly page is mapped as a stack. So that's the proof that this is a stack page. So yeah, we are here. Fast forward. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, so, just to summarize everything, at first we would like to thank uh, NVIDIA for developing uh, such an amazing uh, execution environment that we can analyze. We want to uh, thank the offensive security research team, we want to thank the GPU software security team, we want to thank the product security team and Adacore for creating such a brilliant language and uh, everyone who was involved in this research. And uh, to summarize what we did, um, uh, the use of the type safety language, like formal verification, uh, can minimize the attack surface, not only for the memory safety issues, but for other issues as well. Uh, but it's not a silver bullet. As you can see here, there is also other issues, and we need to keep this in mind. And also, formally verified software has a much higher quality, thanks to the enforcement, and also can prove that dynamic checks cannot fail if you have assurance of silver plus, and also it enables much more efficient security efforts and uh, in short most of the bugs which we saw requires like a deep knowledge and deep understanding of the software and also hardware not only software you need to analyze the entire execution environment in the details and in, as a result the bugs which we uh, found it's a more architectural bugs more design issues more uh, deeper problems essentially and again in short just to repeat again uh, the summary of the reviews like if you lose memory and safe language we internally found around 40 50 bucks uh, in average during the review uh, in the time frame of four weeks in the memory safe language we found only five ten even if you spent 50 percent more of the time of them on average and but the bugs which we found is better quality of the bugs so that's all thanks <laughs> and we could take some questions i think we still have four minutes Come on. Uh, so the So the question is how many bugs in Spark we found in NVIDIA when we analyzed the uh, software written in Spark. So in general we haven't seen any software where we did not find the bugs, <laughs> that's what we can say. So essentially every software which is written have some bugs. Uh, we haven't seen anyone without the bugs, although uh, also it's worth to mention that the software which we write usually it's a huge in scale, it's complicated and we also have a custom hardware. So this is very difficult to model, so most of the bugs uh, we found in this area, how many of them, we cannot say the numbers, but certainly it's uh, significantly lower than in the memory safe language. In memory safe, sorry. <laughs> Thanks.